Jesus, I love you so, never want to let you go. And all the love you have for me, Jesus, do you see what you mean to me? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to New Hope in the Lord. I'm Reverend Joseph, your host, and I thank you for watching our broadcast today. And what we bring to you is hope, a new hope. And there's only one that gives new hope, and uh, it's Jesus Christ. And having a personal relationship with him, being born again by, your, by his spirit, and it's a life-changing experience, and it's progressiveness. It comes over a period of time, just like a newborn baby comes out of its mother's womb. It doesn't throw a football when it's out of mm. its mother's womb, but it takes time. So we have two guests on today, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy our broadcast. So, Rosa, would you like to introduce our guest, please? Sure. We have Rosemary Von Trapp. Welcome to our program, Rosemary. Your family you. was portrayed in the movie, The Sound of Music. Yes, we are. We're right. very much Thank honored you. to have you here. And then here we have Regina. Welcome to our program. Thank Regina you. Garbelli. Welcome <laughs> yes. to our program yes. today. Nice to be here and come down all the way from oh, Morrisville, Vermont. Vermont. Yeah. yeah Thank to you. Come for inviting to New York. us and having us here with you. Yes. We enjoyed our stay with you. Amen. So, yes, uh, 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 so Rosemary, you want to uh, start the program by sharing how you came to know Jesus? I will, yes. definitely. Without him, I can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible, right? Yes, mm -hmm. amen. And uh, I grew up uh, in a Catholic uh, uh, household with my family. And... Uh, we came to America because uh, Hitler was um, uh, getting after people who were not on his side. Mm. And uh, my father showed that he was not on Hitler's side by, by not flying the flag, not um, joining the Navy, and not having his family sing for Hitler's birthday. Mm. So we had a butler. And the butler used to be my bro my my dad's uh, sailor, one of my sa one of his sailors, and he was faithful to my dad uh, as a butler. And one day he came to my dad and said, um, "I think it's time for you to go because the borders are going to be sh cro uh, closed and yes. you won't be able to get out." And my dad said, "How do you know?" And uh, he turned his lapel, and there was the swastika. Mm. So that meant he was on Hitler's side, but he was still faithful to my dad. Wow. So he saved our life. Wow. And after that, my dad took a, we, we took our backpacks, we took a train. Behind our house was a railroad station. We went to Italy. We came to, through France to England, took a boat called the American Farmer, and came to America. <laughs> And uh, that's uh, the end of that story and the beginning of a new, new life. So what happened when you came to America? Oh, well, my, my brother was born in January, and my, our manager didn't like babies, so he said, you go back to Europe. We had to go back to Europe and uh, start over again. Got a new manager, came back again a third time, not on aeroplanes, <laughs> on boats. Yeah. At that time, there were no aeroplanes. So we came back. We ended up in Philadelphia. And my mother wanted to be in the mountains to remind her of Austria. And she, a friend uh, took her to Stowe, Vermont. And we've been there ever since. We built a house there. And on a hilltop with a beautiful view, and my mother, my, my dad was very happy. Then he got uh, cancer and he died in 47. And uh, that was the end of his uh, experience with us. And uh, then I had a nervous breakdown. And that's how the Lord had to lead me to find Jesus as a personal savior. Because as a Catholic or as a the way we grew up, we did not learn that. We never learned to read the Bible. And so the Holy Spirit had to guide me 
through many troubles and tri tribulations and bad experiences of rebellion. I didn't know I had so much rebellion inside of me. But uh, when I was 40 in Syracuse, New York, with a, living with a boyfriend who I started to fight with, and uh, I said my renewal sinner's prayer with a man on the radio in my bedroom one night. Mm -hmm. And uh, next day I woke up, no guilt, no depression, no anything, just joy and a beautiful new beginning. So that was a new beginning for me, and I came back home. And my oldest sister, Agatha, had also another experience with the Holy Spirit. And she said, let's go for a seminar in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which we did. And they all went to, buy, to prayer meetings and Bible studies, and I was rebellious still mm. and went off on a walk into, to find a drugstore or something. And on the way in the suburbs, I heard this huge voice say, no man's land. It was like a real reprimand to tell me where I was going. And I couldn't see anybody. And uh, I thought, maybe that was God. But I didn't want him to know I heard him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I pretended I didn't hear him, and I kept walking. And I ended up at a dead end. And uh, a, a, an old house was there. And I realized if I walked through this woods and the dead end, I would end up in no man's land and I would become an old abandoned house. And so I turned back and I went up and found everybody in the gym with raised hands, praising the Lord and speaking in tongues. And I, I, got, I got my first insp inspired scripture in my mind, which is Psalm 84. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of my walk with Jesus. It, it, it's yes, absolutely God. amazing <coughs> how God knows yeah, how uh, to reach us. what we need, yes. when, when we, we need, need it, it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and where we need it. Uh, yeah. uh, she's in the woods. And all of a sudden, the loud voice, sometimes it comes in a small voice. Yes. But you were so rebellious, yep. Rosemary, you needed a loud <laughs> voice. Something to stop on. Something <laughs> to, to do that. And, 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 it's, and it's absolutely a tremendous witness how you can't run away from God. Mm. Yes. When God's going to get you. You know, mm -hmm. years ago they had a commercial uh, on uh, TV, it was a white aisle commercial with the cigar. It says, we're gonna get you. <laughs> you smoke one of those white aisle cigars and then uh. you, you're hooked on it. Rosemary, thank you so much yes. for sharing about the thank Von Trapp family yes. and how God used the enemy yes. of the United States of America, the butler, yeah. to have favor with your father Amen. to save your family. Amen. And I was up in Stowe, uh, Vermont, about a month and a half ago, preaching in Morrisville. And I've been up in Morrisville preaching many times, Amen. but I never went to the Von Trapp Lodge. Okay. And I went last month, and uh, you say on a mountain, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. If I was to go in the fall and, and go and live in the lodge, and mm -hmm. I had a, a balcony there, yeah. I would sit in the morning tonight till it got dark and just look at that foliage is, how uh, yeah. how beautiful it is it so is. thank you very much uh, you, rosemary, rosemary. For, for coming on the show we appreciate that yeah. thank you so regina uh can you tell the audience how you came up to know the lord your upbringing and your experience with the lord yes um i grew up similarly like rosemary um my mother was from Germany, my father was in the army, and I had a very nice home, a very good upbringing, um, Catholic upbringing, went to church and just had the normal life. But I was rebellious too. I had this spirit of rebellion in me that um, 
caused me to do a lot of harm in my family. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to be told what to do. Yeah. And so when I was told this is how it is, this is what you're going to do, I would say no and I would do something else. And so my parents, they didn't know what to do with me. They tried punishing me, put me in my room, lock the door. I would open a window and jump out. How old were you at this point? At 13. Wow. When I was about That's 13, yeah, yes. I began running away from home. I ended up on the streets in Fall River, Massachusetts with the other people that are troubled and lost, um, not living a very yeah. good life. And by the time I was 16, I ended up in California. And um, there, I happened to go to a prayer meeting. Somebody brought me to a um, just a gathering of Christians, and it happened to be Mike McIntosh. And he came from the Calvary Chapel movement, and he had had his brains blown up by drugs and he received prayer and was healed. His marriage was restored and he was healed and I thought that's powerful. Here's a man, I know he's telling the truth and, and he's had an experience. I, I want something like that. So I gave myself to God. I, I asked Jesus into my life but I didn't um, surrender. I was still the rebellious girl doing her own thing. So I had Jesus sort of with me but I wasn't surrendered to Jesus. It's, it's basically almost the same thing as what, what Rosemary said. It then. is. And, and you, you know, uh, Rose, the people, they, oh, he's a good person. She's a good person. Yeah. Because they do good things. And Americans are very kind and generous people, and charitable yes. people. Mm -hmm. But we look on the, he's a good person or she's a good person because of what they do. But deep down inside, the Bible says that our hearts are wicked, wicked. and mm -hmm. deceitful and evil. Yes. Uh, Solomon said they're mad in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 3. And that stubbornness there is what is God's loves to take people who are stubborn and to change them so that they become more and more like Jesus. And so what was the, what was the catalyst uh, for you, uh, um, Regina, that, that caused this stubbornness? to, you know, be kind of more towards this is not the right, not right, right way for me to be. Well, ultimately, a person that goes their own way ends up in a destructive place, which I ended up in a divorce. I had eight children. I had a husband. And we went through a divorce. And as a single mom with young children, I left California and felt drawn towards Vermont. And I ended up in Vermont at the end of myself, I, I said, Lord, I don't want to be like this anymore. I don't want to be thinking my own thoughts and doing my own thing because I, I'm not going in good direction. Change me. Mm. And so then I knew I needed to go to church. And I visited different churches in my area, and I ended up at a church called New Beginning Miracle Fellowship. And there I, I received the training, um, the Bible and, and the words and, and just the life that I needed, the spiritual life. And that was my journey. That was the beginning of it. Probably I was around 40 years old. It's, it's just like you. Then um, everything worked good after yeah, that. So in, in other words, it's not just enough to accept Jesus in your heart. Then you have to continue in his ways. And now you're going to continue yeah. in his ways unless you know the word of God. Yeah. So you decided that that's what you needed. Absolutely. It was the Word of God that became life to you. Yes. And uh, and what happens as a result of this new life? Well, new beginning. I didn't, I didn't know how I was going to raise my children and I had had a restaurant in California and I knew I wasn't going to be doing that so I cried out. I said, God, what can I do to, to make a living that isn't going to take me forever to learn? And I felt inspired to become a barber. And then I went through training to become a barber. And God put me in such a wonderful shop, um, Everett's Stowe Barber Shop. And he just had a wonderful clientele. He was in his 70s at the end of his career. And I, I joined him, and he sold me his shop. And I decided to dedicate that shop to God rather than just make it Regina's barber shop. I wanted it to be God's barber shop. 
But now you were sharing with us before then that people would say, you'll never be successful at cutting hair and <laughs> doing this and that. And not even a beautician, you wanted to be a barber. So how did you manage that? How did you prove them wrong? Well, it's true. I, I apprenticed with a barber for nine months, and then I went to barber school in New Mexico. I took a short detour. And in the school, they called me into guidance, and they said, Regina, you're telling everyone you want to be a barber, <laughs> but we have to tell you, we want you to be successful. Yeah. And this isn't, you're not going to make a good barber. You, you can do maybe perhaps fingernails or work with color, but it takes you over an hour to cut someone's hair and it doesn't look very good after you're done. And so I, I went to God, I didn't get discouraged. <laughs> I went to God and I said, Lord, I know that you inspired me to cut hair. What do I need to do to get that skill? And so when I woke up the next morning, um, God gave me this, this inspiration to go to all the nursing homes in my area to volunteer to do free haircuts. And I did. I showed up and I did the haircuts. And as I began doing that, I gained confidence and I gained the skill level necessary. And God gave you the it's shop. A, <laughs> yes, and, he and, did. And, uh, it's a it's a successful shop, yes. you know, and I've been there. And um, she has on the wall uh, pictures and pictures and pictures of her clients. Fine. Not just put a picture up, but frame, put a frame yeah. there, yeah. and then R Regina prays over them, prays for them, and uh, that that's your ministry. What? Why don't you tell us uh, a um, a story about? Uh, something that comes to your mind that happened in your shop that was to glorify the Lord? Yeah, um, well, the most, probably the most transforming thing that happened in my shop was a man named Tom Silva um, came one day, and I didn't know him and he didn't know me. And he said, I've come to the barber shop to give you a message from the Lord. And I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, I got woken up by God last night, and I heard the Lord say that your shop has been put in the center of Stowe for a purpose, a divine purpose. And it's not for what you think it's for, but you're going to see an increase in spiritual activities here because God has blessed this shop. He's blessed you, and he has placed angels around your shop for protection. Mm. And... It was interesting because then that man, he is also friends with Rosemary, he was also called upon to pray, um, to gather people together to pray. So Rosemary and Tom and a group of us began meeting in the basement of our community church every Monday for five years. Mm. We met, and I believe you came one day, Reverend Joseph, to that yeah, prayer. That's right. L last year, I believe. It was, yeah. yeah. So we did that every Monday. We never missed a Monday. If Tom couldn't be there, Rosemary was there. If Rosemary couldn't be there, I was there. There was always two and often 10 or 12 of us, and we gathered to pray. So, yeah, Tom Silva was um, somebody that heard from the Lord. And I never even knew what that meant, hearing from the Lord, until I began hearing from the Lord myself. Was there, any, was there anything that you want to share with the audience about some some miracle that might have happened to uh, a one a client of yours. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, I was cutting hair, and it was a busy day. There were many people waiting for haircuts. When I say many, maybe five or six, and all of a sudden, um, a couple came through the door, and they announced that they were from Rye, New York, and that they had been sent to Vermont to pray. And as they passed the barber shop. They felt the Spirit of the Lord telling them to come in and pray in my shop. So they asked, and I said, yes, please, you can pray. And so they began laying hands on pictures and on the walls, praying. And my men were getting up and getting in the chair, getting their hair cuts. What's going on, Regina? I said, well, people are called from God to come and pray, so that's what they're doing. Oh, okay. And then the woman, she said, I, I feel like the Lord's leading me to sing. I, I think I'm supposed to sing. And so she began singing in the shop. And still, you know, the people waited, got their haircuts. And then finally, they were all done except for one. And the last man was Roger Barry from Morrisville. 
And Roger had come before and was very sick. He had a, a distended stomach. He was very pale, very um, perspiring, and just very sick. He had um, advanced liver cancer. Mm. And the last time I had spoken to him, he had said that he'd only had three months left to live. So I said, Roger, look, you're here. These people from New York are here. I, this can't be a coincidence. Let's pray. And so Roger said yes, and we prayed. And then the people from New York left, Roger left, and that was that. And I, I you know, probably continued praying for him, but then it went out of my mind. And maybe eight months later, Roger walked through the door, but I didn't recognize him because he looked different. His hair was dark, his face looked healthy. And I said, Roger, is that you? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what's happened to you? Yeah, what's happened to you, Roger? <laughs> and he said, well, I, I have to believe it was the prayers, Regina, because when I went to Dartmouth after my haircut, he said they couldn't find the cancer anymore. The cancer was gone. And I told him, I said, God's healed you. You need to testify. You need to tell people God has healed you. Yeah. And he agreed. Wow. Yes, God Thanks has healed God. me. Yeah, I mean, the power of prayer. L l liver cancer. Yes. I feel bad for atheists. Mm. Uh, I really do because this country and the world mm. is going down the toilets real fast yeah. and uh, they have no hope. Uh, where do you turn? Yeah. As an atheist, mm -hmm. you turn to drugs, you turn to alcohol, you turn to partying, you turn to sex, you turn to all these things that are m more destructive. Yes, because they own the sickness. They, once they, they hear it, it's like they take ownership of it. Yeah, we're not supposed to take ownership. Cancer. Right. Yeah. It's we're not, not our battle. It's Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. And he won, the, he yeah. won it for us. He not won the ours, battle. It's the mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And, and yeah. so... Uh, can I say something? Sure, sure. you can. Rosemary. Yeah, well, I forgot to say that yes. after I said my sinner's <coughs> prayer, yes. my, my partner there, he said to me, I had a dream about you. I said, okay, what's your dream? He said, my dead brother came to visit me. And he said, don't touch that girl, she's special. So I said, what do you mean, she touched that girl and she's special? He said, well, I was going to throw you off a bridge. So, I, you know how, wow. how serious our fighting was. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> we wow. were really wow. uh, getting to the end of the rope and I said well I think it's time for me to go home and mm. so I, I did eventually. Well so, so see, but you, you see the hand of God yeah, mm -hmm. on you right. from a right. little girl. Right yeah. from above I mean right. in yes. a dream the Lord mm. comes to us in dreams and visions. Visions right? yes, yes even today and yes. Anything is possible yeah. with yeah. God. See the, the enemy wanted to kill you because yeah. <laughs> uh, you know it, it, the message right. you have the the testimonies you have yes we have something to tell and everybody has a story yes and everybody has important in god's eyes because i was just reading in a book that god wrote a story in a book for everybody before the world began before he created us he wrote our Names. Our names and yeah. our future. Into, Some, yes. Yeah, Psalm, one, into Psalm 130. Yeah, Psalm 139. So everybody's important, and yes. thank God we can all be brothers and sisters if <laughs> we have faith it's, it's in Christ. Yes. Yes. Even Jesus, our yeah. brother, our savior. Elder brother. Yes. The Amen. one who shared his blood with us and who, who was willing to come down from heaven and then go back to earth. In his resurrection, he go, did go a round back. trip. Go back to heaven. Go back to heaven. Yeah. He did yes. a round trip. He's yes, going to he do did. another round yes, trip. He will. And, 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 <laughs> and he didn't have to call up the airlines and get a, <laughs> right. a, a outrageous uh, price. Uh, Amen. So, Re Regina, would you like to say something to the audience uh, before we uh, close the show? Anything that might be on your heart? Do you want to sing a song? No, I don't want to <laughs> sing a song, Rosemary. <laughs> well, yeah. But I, I feel obedience is, is something that we're all struggling with, that um, we're all being tested, and, and God wants to birth things through us. And it can't happen until we become obedient, until we actually submit ourselves. We can't just add Jesus to our life. We have to lay our life down and allow Jesus to, to be the one to move ahead of us and 
to be the one to um, author what we're doing. So it's obedience, and obedience, as my pastor always says, sets the stage for miracles. It creates the atmosphere for miracles. And we don't like being obedient. We like doing our own thing, and our society doesn't want us to, to be obedient. You know, we're supposed to think about ourselves. So that's the wrong thing. The right thing is to, to lay down before the Lord and allow Him to move through us and to just say, yes, Lord. It, it's a, a country that we live in. Uh, it's uh, rights, our rights. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if our rights are right in God's sight or wrong in God's sight. It's... Um, to satisfy our flesh, yeah, most th of it. Th there's, there's, mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's nothing... W w what's right today in America and most of the world uh, is wrong in God's sight and and they say what's right is wrong and what's wrong is right and that's where the the problem and the Word of God does in. say that that people will be calling what's wrong right and what's right wrong yeah. Yeah. we tells see that with that abortions and, and many other things yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah and, and they don't know God's judgment that's why you know, the Bible tells us very plainly that there's a judgment there for everybody. Yes, there is. And in the book of Revelation, those that uh, are going to come from hell and uh, death and the sea will give up the dead. They're going to go before God and their names are not going to be written in the book of life. And they're just going to be final judgment is cast off into the uh, lake, lake of, of fire. fire. That's right. You know? mm. Mm. Well, Rosemary, thank you so much for coming on to our program thank and you give your testimony. Me, Rose. Nice <laughs> and Regina, you. God thank bless you. you. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. The, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the gift of God, the greatest gift you can ever get in your world, the world is not financial, it's not any toys, but it's knowing Jesus in a personal way. For the Bible says the gift of God God so loved you that he gave his only son, that the gift of God is receiving Christ in your heart, repenting, coming a child of God, and having a new life in Christ. Mm -hmm. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in and watching our broadcast today. Jesus, I love you so. you need to be